And so I want to welcome you all to the Waypoint 55 webinar. Uh, that is uh, tonight, and the topic very specifically is uh, Becoming Ascending Church 101. There's the basics on getting them there and helping them stick. And so we're glad that you're here with us. Uh, my name is Tim Cole. I'm the Executive Director of Waypoint Church Partners. And uh, Waypoint serves Christian churches and Churches of Christ in the Mid-Atlantic region by uh, helping both churches and leaders to get on mission and to stay on mission. And so we do that in a variety of ways. But this webinar series we've been doing for the past year to help uh, people in the church on ministry-related topics in 55 minutes or less. And so we're going to attempt to be done about 825 this evening, uh, Eastern time. And so we're glad that you're joining us. Uh, if you're new to our webinar uh, platform. Uh, I want to explain just a couple of things on the interface that you're seeing. First of all, at the bottom of your uh, screen, you'll see that there's a Q&A button that you can uh, click on and, and ask a question of the presenters tonight. Uh, and you can ask them at any time. And I'd recommend that you uh, go ahead and type those questions in. As soon as you think of them, they get put in a queue. And then as we have time at the end of the session, uh, we'll be able to answer your questions in the order that they were received. And uh, so you can do that. If we don't get to answer your question tonight because we run out of time, we get a report and with your name and email and your question, and we'll follow up uh, within the next day or so answering any of the questions that we're unable to answer this evening. There will be a follow-up email that goes out in 24 hours after this that will provide some links and, to resources and other things that are mentioned in the webinar tonight, uh, including the slide deck, if, because we always have people say, hey, can I get a copy of the slides for that? Uh, we will make a copy of that available to you that will be in a link in the follow-up email that you receive tomorrow as being part of the presentation tonight. The other button that you'll see there is a polling button. Uh, our, and uh, actually, I don't know if you see that, but I do. And uh, that's where I, we are able to ask you questions. And the first question that we've learned that we need to ask is kind of an attendance question. We discovered very quickly when we started doing these webinars that often uh, there are multiple people per computer, often three, four, five, even eight or ten uh, people per computer uh, that they'll meet at church or other places and gather around one screen. And so I'd like to launch a poll right now just so we can get a sense of how many people are on our uh, webinar tonight by launching this poll. And if you would go ahead and kind of uh, lo uh, log in your attendance, that'll help us get a sense of how many people that we're reaching. We also get a report after the fact of how many people, and I anticipate that we'll have people from more than 10 states uh, around the United States. I don't know if we'll have any international ones tonight, but at least 10 states will be represented tonight. That's kind of cool. And uh, uh, so um, you, uh, many people are answering that already. As a few final people uh, log in, I'm gonna end that poll and get out of here. All right, we'll get that figured out later. There we go. I'm going around this, speak of you, there we go. And uh, so um, we want to thank you for being part of this webinar. The, the topic tonight is, is for mission teams and mission committees about understanding how to become ascending church, not just a, a supporting church, but ascending church. And there's a difference. And uh, because your missionaries need more care than just a check sent to them, uh, every month. And I can tell you that personally, uh, when, when uh, my wife and I, our family were missionaries 25 years ago, we went through an episode where we needed acute uh, missionary care. And uh, the agency that we were under at that time provided the best that they were able to do, but it really wasn't completely sufficient for what we needed. And it, it exposed for me the great need there is out there for missionaries on the field to be receiving active, intentional care not only from their agency that they're a part of, but from the churches that, are, that have sent them. And, and so we're going to talk about that tonight. We've got two great presenters uh, for us tonight. They were with us uh, six months ago as well. It's Brian Gibson and Donna Cole. And you can see their faces and smiles on the screen, I'm assuming, right now as well. And uh, Brian uh, has uh, served in a variety of roles in missions. He and his family were missionaries for uh, seven years in Kosovo as church plant as church planters. 
Uh, three of his four kids were born there in Kosovo. Then after that, they served as, uh, he served as a mission minister at a church in Memphis, Tennessee. And then more recently, he served in his role as the executive director of Train International. And so what a broad range of experience from missionary on the field to in a local church as a missions pastor and now directing a missions agency. And so Train International that he directs uh, provides pre-field missionary training and then re-entry debriefing and then church coaching on mission strategy, missionary care, and all other kinds of things that support churches and missionaries. And so we're glad that Brian is on uh, tonight to present to us. And then we've also got uh, Donna Cole, uh, and she has been a missionary care provider uh, and a pastoral counselor for more than 25 years. 14 of those years were as the director of missionary care for a missions agency. And for the last 11 years, uh, has been uh, serving a, a local church, a large local church in Missouri. And so she provides pre-field, on-field, and post-field training, counsel, and care to missionaries and has done that to missionaries in more than 35 countries. And uh, so she uh, is, uh, has been around the globe a couple times, uh, and uh, she is currently affiliated with Train International, Barnabas International, Team Expansion, and Puente Missionary Ministries, which I did not know, uh, as well as in her local church as uh, in the Ministry of Missionary Care. And uh, so we are glad that the two of them are uh, presenting to us tonight. They have been colleagues and have collaborated together for more than 17 years. And so tonight they're going to be sharing with us a lot of wisdom on helping us as local churches uh, taking care of our missionaries. So without uh, much further ado, I just want to hand the ball off to them and let them jump right in. Uh, and I want to remind you, if you have questions along the way, please hit the Q&A button, get your question in the queue, and we'll try and answer those at the end of the session. All right, Brian, it's all, it's all yours. Actually, it's all mine. Um, so I'm going to start by welcoming you to, um, to this webinar and remind us that we're talking about kingdom things tonight. And um, there really isn't anything more important that we could talk about than kingdom things. But sometimes we get involved in our separate ministries and we kind of forget that big picture that we are all in the kingdom and we have tasks and roles to do. But uh, Jesus had much to say about the kingdom. So let's just set the, set the stage tonight for talking about that. And so welcome um, to this webinar and, and Brian and I are going to share uh, separately and together and sometimes uh, we'll interrupt each other. So just join us in our conversation. We know each other well and, um, and can um, we take care of each other. So That's Brian, right. it's yours. All right. Hey, thanks for having us back. What a privilege, appreciate it. If you wanna jump into some of the slides, that first slide we're looking at, kind of the foundations that we're calling it the 101 of being a sending church. So uh, I really like, first of all, the one of the lines that Bill Hybels is famous for. He says, everyone wins when a leader gets better. And similarly, we can apply that to the nations, that the nations, the world, the unreached peoples of the world, those who are not yet part of the kingdom that we celebrate that we are part of, that they win when a church aligns more with becoming a sending church. So this matters. This isn't just trying to get a little bit more polished or a little bit more strategy, a little bit more structured in the way that we do things. This has radical implications for people gathered around the throne. And I'm excited and I'm thankful for the opportunity. I'm glad that there are as many of you here with us as there are and look forward to walking through some of what we're going to talk about. So first of all, that next slide looks a little bit at what, what are we talking about? There are a lot of definitions and a lot of understandings for sending churches. So Tim, if you jump ahead, that um, when we talk about sending and sustaining, uh, one of my professors would often say back in, in college, he would say, you know, it's really important to remember words mean things. They actually mean things. So when we're talking about being a sending church, these next two slides are going to orient you to what we mean and where we're going to go. Uh, it is worth just reiterating here the slides themselves are yours to keep. And so there are some great resources in some of what we, we want to pass along and share with you. Some of it, we're going to go into a lot of detail about what's on the screen. Some of it, we're going to kind of dip right past. You might feel like, oh no, oh no, I didn't write that down. I didn't get that captured. So no worries on that. So 
the ongoing care to back up the class, two really critical pieces. And part of this, we brought this up in our first webinar that Tim is going to give you a link uh, at the end of this when you get that email 24 hours after tonight's webinar. You get a link to go back and watch the first webinar that we did more specifically on missionary care. But these two underlying concepts here that we're talking about an ongoing process that involves the preparing missionaries, equipping them and empowering them for what? To help them as the sending church, we walk in those ongoing rhythms so that they are prepared for uh, effective and sustainable life ministry and work. So that, that's a critical, crucial role and there's a lot to that. And I think whenever we start having serious conversations about what does it mean to be a sending church, and how can we advance and take some steps towards that? I think immediately what churches that I've been a part of and churches that we've coached, they're kind of, there's that switch that kind of goes off and says, uh-huh, okay, so you're talking about something that I can't do. You're talking about something that our church is not outfitted for. We don't have the resources or the capacity to do X, Y, and Z. But these inclusive terms of an ongoing process of being involved, being one, a church that is involved and has gone through the befriending go into and helping missionaries live in a way that's sustainable uh, is beautiful. It is absolutely attainable. And because the Lord has called us to it, there is absolutely no church, uh, regardless of our, our resource base, regardless of our personnel base, there's no church that can't play a pivotal role in this. So be encouraged. So jumping ahead, what are we talking about? I'm going to give you two really big definitions. Uh, one, um, one definition of ascending church, uh, we'll be talking about moving you forward to be a church that sends well and sustains well. So there's a great resource that's been written by the guys at the Upstream Collective. That next slide right there. Thank you. This is a quote from the book called The Sending Church Defined, which is a very apt title for a book that would do such a thing. And I'm going to read it in such a way that you understand how weighty it is and then kind of adapt our own definition for our purposes. It is a local community of Christ followers who made a covenant together to be prayerful, deliberate, and proactive in developing, commissioning, and sending their own members, both locally and globally, often in partnership with other churches or agencies, and continuing to encourage, support, and advocate for them while making disciples across culture. So that's very inclusive. And the whole book basically devotes chapters to unpacking word by word and phrase by phrase what each of those components mean and how do we build them for tonight <laughs> we're not going to that level of detail so if you jump ahead here's kind of what we wanted this is the bite we wanted to take out of this the sending church is one that will assume a significant level of responsibility and accountability for the global workers that they'll send so that's doable that, that other picture might sound a little unattainable unrealistic but that, this is doable and i want to give three pictures <clears throat> three ideas in this next slide. There are three levels or three places that a church might find themselves when we say, what, what are we doing when it comes to missions? What are, we, what are we sending and how are we sending? And those three levels could be, we're sending people anywhere. We're sending our money to maybe haphazardly, but we're sending it generously and we're sending people anywhere because the whole world's lost and we want to see them reach. So our strategy is we might not write it down this way, but at this phase or this stage, it might not be articulated in a way that would go beyond, well, when good people want to do good work in needy places, that's what we do. We say yes to that. And that's a good place to start. Uh, that's a pivot point from nowhere. It's certainly better to <laughs> be doing things anywhere. <laughs> nowhere. <out there. laughs> that's right. There could be nowhere. But we, don't, we don't want to draw that. We don't want to curse anyone. Uh, then maybe a little bit more progress towards sending people somewhere. We are a little more intentional. We're sending our money, but now we're also sending our people generously, but often haphazardly, which if that sounds like a weighty word or an accusatory word, I don't mean it that way. It just means that there's, there's not necessarily a real driving principle that is helping to direct where our resources are going. There's a great need out there. It's a big planet. There are a lot of lost people. So we're either sending anywhere or we're sending somewhere. What might it look if we said we're sending people right there with that level of specificity that we're sending money and we're sending our people, but we're doing it strategically. 
we're doing it based on principles with intentionality and aligned with a vision. And so here at the outset, when I say that, that sounds like we're talking about the mission statement of a corporation or something with their mission, vision, and goals and things like that. But what we're trying to draw a picture of here early on, this next uh, slide, don't go through it just yet, but no one church is asked or tasked or realistically capable of reaching the whole world. That's not what the Lord asks of us, and nor is it something that if we were to lean into it with all of our full capacities, we could never pull off. But if you take a look, if there's a list of the missionaries that your church supports and you take a look at it, it tells a story. And you might not have connected the dots quite yet of what that story is. If you make a list and put the dots on the map and say, here's where it looks like over the years, we have a lot of people that have asked us to, to help them do cross-cultural ministry. We haven't said yes to all of them, but we've said yes to these people. Why? So that last uh, uh, slide that we were looking at says we're sending who and what and where and why. And being able to answer those questions, each one of them, what are, we, what are we sending? We're sending money and people. And who are we sending? Whoever comes by the church and has a good story. Uh, and where are we sending? Wherever the need is, which can be anywhere. And why are we sending? Well, because, because we have to. We should. We ought to. And sometimes that's the level that we find ourselves at. Or if you're on the front end of that and you haven't sent anybody, but you want to, it, maybe it's good to work through those three things and maybe settle on the bottom one first. Um, it will take, you're going to, you're going to find that you'll have some resources from Brian tonight to know how to do that. And so on. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, that next slide is a, a map of the world. And I do, I love what happens when a group of people in a church start asking questions, talking to the Lord and saying, all right, what have we been up to? And why is that? Because it might seem, and it might have been somewhat haphazard, but if you can see a region of the world where it seems like, you know, our people have really resonated with anything that we can do that gets out in front of human trafficking and puts an end to that. And, you know, it might look absolutely disconnected. We've got people all over the globe. So geographically, there's no thread that connects the story. But wait a minute, there's a cause. There's a cause that our church is passionate about being involved in. Maybe it's not a cause. Maybe it is, it's a religion. We really want to make a dent in reaching Muslims for Christ. And so if I look at the map of where we've sent people on short-term trips or where we've got missionaries that we've said yes to or where we've got some sort of attached affiliation, it will tell a story. And if that hasn't happened yet, that you've got some dots on the map, then just the conversation itself, what are we passionate about as a group and as a church? then it can help you align so that you can start saying yes to being at the type of sending church that will make a significant impact in some specific way. Okay. Where are we now? Let's jump ahead, Tim. We've got another, another little uh, chart here. So there's a, something that you might see as a, a deficient. Not to, uh, I don't want to reiterate too much of what I've already said, but it's really easy to use in some ways the model of Acts 1-8 and say that's going to be our reference point. That is what we're going to build our strategy on. And it says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, which is a declaration of Jesus as he is commissioning his disciples. So it's scripture in the Bible and it's potent and it's powerful and it's the words of Christ himself. But it is maybe not the best foundation upon which to build strategy because it's so inclusive when we boil that down to here we're going to do ministry here in our uh, jerusalem near in our judea samaria and far to the ends of the earth you can draw the circle around a whole lot of really worthwhile ministries that are local regional and international but not still have discerned what is it that god is calling this church to be a part of what is it our answer to the Great Commission. So it's a great reference point, but it's not probably the clearest foundation upon which to build your church's strategy for becoming a sending church. Make sense? You say so. Thanks. <laughs> Tim, Tim's nodding his head. Good. Okay. Um, this next slide, I, as we've read through the, the guys that wrote the Sending Church to Find, they tell a story 
about this church that it's a huge, really missional church that's famous for having a massive budget, more than $2 million per year. They ended up with 379 missionaries that they supported all over the world, and they were looked up to. And then these guys bump into them and start having conversations and realized, in their words, they said they had shotgunned themselves into becoming a supporting church instead of a a sending church. So in some ways, their strategy was, we're going to try to get people all over the world. We're going to be doing a lot of good stuff, but that wasn't aligned with anything yet. So now they had to do the hard work and get the journey down that hard road of becoming a sending church. So please don't hear or understand us saying this is something that uh, that some rinky-dinky church might end up doing, but not the really advanced church. No, this is this, there are a lot of worthwhile things that we can be doing, incredible ministries we can become a part of. What does it look like to determine beforehand and align ourselves with a vision that will become compelling and will guide our decisions? That's, that's the question there. As we go on in, in to the evening, um, while we're talking, to become a sending church really allows the church to become personally involved in caring and sustaining their workers rather than what this quote called the shotgunning support around the world. And so we'll talk about that a little bit later. All right, I have a question. Here's a question for you. Before sending, and now we're about to jump into some of the meat of our conversation tonight. There, there's the cautionary word of where that church found themselves. Here is a, a question for Cindy. Where are you going? So uh, the next, the picture that Tim will pull up next is from uh, Alice in Wonder, where um, Alice bumps into the Cheshire Cat and she's asking for directions because she's lost. And she says, well, which road do I take? And you can see there that, well, where are you going? It's his answer. And she doesn't know where she's going. So his answer is that, well, kind of doesn't matter which road you take because if you don't know where you're going any road will get you there so determining some of that beforehand is really crucial if we want to play that role of being a sending church that sends our people well then we need to do some of that pre-work as a body to come to conclusions about what is our what is our church called to so the the four pieces that don't I want to step into now and talk through are four phases you could call in the the film firing. I love what happens when you put pottery in a kiln, when people take clay and shape it and form it and stick it in a kiln that comes out this virtually indestructible what once was just just a simple moldable piece of, of nothing and yet when it's put under pressure and heat that it becomes something completely different that has been tempered and is strong. And so in a lot of ways, the process of us as a church, as we send people to the field, there's a kiln firing that's going on on the people's lives that we're sending. And it's going to continue once they get to the field because it certainly doesn't get any easier once they land and begin the hard work of cross-cultural ministry. But these four phases of putting them into and joining them in some of these processes will help us make sure that we're preparing them well and we're learning some things along the way. So those are befriending and then mending and tending, sending and depending. So the first phase would be befriending, which really just at a a base level just involves taking the time with intentionality to come to know your global worker and to know them, of course, generally as people, to know them well, but also in a specific way to determine and discern what are their giftings and what are their aptitudes? Where do those giftings lie? And do they have the aptitude that would indicate that they'd be a good person, a good family to send into the fires of the increased temperature that will be life on the mission field? Not everybody needs to get put into the kiln for cross-cultural ministry. So part of walking through this befriending phase. Some people phase, have to light the fire. <laughs> <laughs> but not everybody needs to get in there. And if that is the case, then it's helpful to know because people may approach you and at church and say, hey, uh, I know you don't know my name because I've never talked to anyone here really or served in any, any capacity at the church. But I think God's calling me to be a missionary and I've chosen the place and I've picked an agency. I need your money. Can I go? Well, that process of befriending someone, if their story is really compelling, 
and the place they want to go is really needy, then by all means, we can easily, easily become enticed to get behind them. But having a process uh, that helps us to discern their giftings is doing a favor to them. It's healthy for the church as we become attached to these the people that we will send. And then it's a gift to the field. It's a gift to the nations as we send people that are our best people and have been prepared to the extent that they are their best versions of themselves. So that also means providing opportunities to serve and teach and practice here the kinds of gifts that would indicate that they'd be effective there. Those are a couple things that come to mind when we look at the defending process. And could you pull up a quick poll, uh, Tim, on, uh, just had a quick question here. Does your church or your missions team have something in place to help you discern people's cross-cultural aptitudes? And then one would be yes, and two would be no. So that's nice and simple. And then um, as you're considering that and answering that, uh, we wanted, in each one of these phases, <laughs> we wanted to give you some good resources. And so three that'd be really helpful that I'll let Donna, you want to talk about these just a bit? It's kind of two, but they're split into three. You can talk about the book in the middle. Um, but on either side of this slide are assessment tools for you as people are coming to you to want to be sent and looking at where they are in their journey toward that and helping them find ways um, in where they can move along the path to some mile markers um, as you begin to send them. And so um, they'll be at the end also, I think, for your, just for one of your resources to help you as you begin in this really exciting journey of sending and sustaining people on the field. Right? Those are, those mile markers are called waypoints, by the way. Waypoints. Uh, right. yeah, that's right. Uh, right. I just thought, I, thought I'd throw that in, but go right ahead. Oh, look at that. You've got a waypoint mug. There you go. And then All then right. Then handbook is an excellent resource for uh, the people that want to go to the field and to go through together with some people from the church. It used to be called Send Me Your Path to the Nations, and it's kind of a workbook that has a lot of questions and things that they can interact with throughout this process. It's very in-depth, but it's a lot of it fun. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not a tiresome chore at all. It's really an enjoyable thing to do together and helpful as well. Next is mending and tending. Okay. Where the psalm is? This will be where the psalm comes. Okay. Yes. So this is my favorite part of the, of um, my opportunity to talk to you because. Uh, can you go to the Psalm twenty three slide? Here. Oh wait, go up, go up one more first. First, I just want you to look at this photo. Um, this was taken two weeks ago by my friend, Krista Welch. Um, and this is, uh, if you see the flock of sheep, this is in North Africa. It's a very pastoral scene. And so you see green pastures, you see quiet waters, and you see over here on the right, the shepherd. And that shepherd probably is standing there right now as we're speaking, tending his flock. And so I just want to go to um, the next slide and read this Psalm 23, because as I've worked um, these years in taking care of missionaries and uh, walking alongside them in all phases of their life and ministry, I have landed on this Psalm um, as the one that really helps me to know how to tend these sheep well and so i want to read it in its entirety but i want you to listen tonight as i read it with either missionaries you support in mind or missionaries that you know or missionaries that you're going to know and so let me just read it and then we'll talk a little bit about some of uh, some of these words the lord and that's capital l capital o capital r capital g so that means yahweh is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for, for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, 
I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare me a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Maybe you could go back to that, that pastoral picture there. Um, first of all, um, we need to remember that it is the Lord who is the shepherd. He is the capital C, capital S, shepherd. And so as we bring people of, to us and through us who will go to the field, first of all, we need to take our people to the shepherd. We need to lead them to him and at times um, get tough or the work gets hard or there are joyous times. We need to take them back to him always. And so that's kind of the overarching principle in this. But now I want to just talk about it as it comes to us who are, who are um, shepherds, under shepherds of the great shepherd, the church, the elders those who are commissioned to be shepherds over our global flock. And so that's who we're talking about. And the first phrase says, I have everything I need because the Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need because I have my under shepherds, because I have my church, my elders, my senders, the people who pray for me, the people who visit me. I have everything I need. I am well supplied. Our people are well supplied. So here's a question, and I want to make some of these words just practical to us. Um, so what are your workers needing that your church can supply ahead of the sending? Well, number one, community. That's huge. You can give them community that they can connect with before they go, people that they learn to love and trust, people who love and trust them, people who know them as people, not people that are put up on a pedestal, that nobody really talks to or thinks they have any need. They are people and we can engage them in several ways, in small groups. Um, there's a, a missionary I know went to church to a church in Virginia Beach, was sent out um, as part of them. They didn't know him. They said, come and, come and live with us for six months or a year. And he attended every small group and he got to know every single person in the church. And, and um, I think Tim was a part of that church when that when that happened. And so he is still connected to everybody in that congregation that was there before he went. Um, or if they can't, if it's a big church and he can't, they can't be part of every small group, they can be part of several and a deep part of at least one. Um, what sort of training can you offer ahead of time or fun uh, for them? Can you send them to a pre-field training such as Train International's Orient, which is probably the best one that I know of, or other pre-fields that are offered in Colorado or South Carolina. Um, or if, if that's too expensive, you could bring a trainer to you and uh, part of your church and your workers could be trained together by one or two trainers and that would cut the cost. I know many that would do that. Um, what about orality training, such as something like Simply the Story, which is teaching people how to tell Jesus stories, especially to cultures that are not literate. And so um, this is working very, very well in, um, in a lot of places. And I have a lot of stories I could tell you about what's happening in Southeast Asia with um, these uh, Jesus story um, the Jesus story approach. Um, they have actually pictures on scars that people have that talk, tell the Jesus story from creation to the uh, to revelation. Um, language acquisition. Uh, not everybody knows how to acquire a language, and so there are skills you can learn um, in language acquisition. And there's trainings around the country. Um, another thing you can do is help your worker consider their views and their scriptural teaching on things like risk and poverty and suffering and waiting. And um, 
there's a, a lot of work has been done in all of these areas and you can and um, there might in the research that we provide at the end uh, we might some of those might be listed I work with our pre-field people on the theology of waiting. What does the Bible say about waiting? Are we just supposed to bolt out of bed in the morning and start in on our job? Or are we to wait on the Lord? And so what does the Bible say about waiting? Because our workers find themselves waiting for a lot of things. So, and then on the field, what can you supply? Do you know what they need? Do you know what they like? Um, how do people in your congregation being encouraged to grow spiritually. Well, can that be translated or shared with your workers somehow? Well, of course it can in this digital age. And always, always, always communication for sure. Mm -hmm. um, another phrase in there says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. And there's a lot of scholars um, who translate that verb a little bit differently. Um, I think it was the King James that translated it makes, but the Hebrew word actually means he settles me down. Doesn't that change? Doesn't that change your view of that word? He settles me down. He settles me down in green pastures because where grace is abundant, sheep are quickly satisfied. Then they lie down and their food digests. He settles me down. In my church, we just had a transition in our global outreach department uh, at the top of our department. And so um, our new global outreach minister and I are working to make sure our global workers feel settled down, even though the leadership has changed. And so for this whole year, our plan is to make our global workers feel settled. Where are those green pastures? for your workers. This part is one of my favorite parts of this of this psalm. And shepherds seek out the green pastures for their sheep. As a member care person, it's my job to know where the green pastures are for my people that I care for. The sheep are not charged with this task. They don't go out and find their green pastures. They do what the sheep do. And your workers are going about accomplishing the task in the ministry they were commissioned or sent to do. They have ministries to do, they have languages to learn, they have risks to avert, they have relationships to build, they have marriages to nourish, and they have children to parent. They don't have time to go out and look for green pastures and quiet waters. So we shepherds need to search those out. Um, I seldom recommend that workers come back to the United States when they need a green pasture, because this is a work pasture here. Uh, when they come back and so they need a green pasture and so for workers in Europe I know where trusted people are and you can find these out through uh, many resources but I, I know where there are green pastures in Budapest and in Croatia I know where there are green pastures in the south of England um, in Hungary in Southeast Asia workers have mean uh, green pastures in many places like Chiang Mai Thailand, there's every green pasture they could ever need. Um, over there in Africa, there are places in Kampala, in South Africa, and so on. So it's my job to know the green pastures. Um, just another, a little aside on green pastures. I have a friend who lives in New Zealand and he tells a story about a shepherd that he knows that's shepherding today. And he has um, the meadows for his sheep and um, that's where they are and live and graze. And then he has a separate uh, place that he plants different grass in. Um, it's closer, it's closer up to where he lives, and it's where he brings the ewes when it's time for them to give birth. And so they have different grass. And then he has another pasture that's planted with even different, better grass that is right next to his house, and that's where he brings the wounded sheep. And to me, that's just a good picture of shepherding your sheep. There, there are times when our sheep are just out and they're doing, they're doing what they do. And then there's special times for them. And then there are wounded times for them. So if your worker needs specific care and you don't know where the green pastures are, those resources abound. And you can start with Barnabas International, who have 100 staff at the ready for your worker. They're ready right now. They'll go right now. He leads me beside quiet waters. 
kind of goes along with the green pastures, except did you know that sheep will not drink from a running stream? They won't even drink from ruffled rivulets. Somebody wrote that. I didn't make that up. They will not. They will not. They will stand there and they will thirst to death. And so the shepherd has to get active again. And there aren't, there aren't any quiet waters. He gets busy and he builds a dam or he digs a trench. He makes a pool so the sheep will drink and then they can rest and digest. So what does that mean for our workers? It's a good question for you to think about. And then it says he restores my soul and that literally means he brings me back. Um, is there a picture of a, she of a shepherd there uh, near that? Is there a slide of a couple of shepherds? There. So look at these shepherds. Hmm. The, these pictures were taken about three years ago. So these are er modern day, gritty, hard working shepherds. This one has rescued a sheep. I mean, he literally does this. This isn't your biblical flowing robe shepherd um, that, that you think of. This is a gritty shepherd from the Middle East, probably a Bedouin. This is a woman who has been shepherding sheep all of her life. Um, and you see, just keep that on those pictures. I just want you to look at those pictures for a minute because uh, as I just talk about these couple of verbs, he brings me back. It literally means course correction. He corrects my course if I get off course. And then he guides me in paths of righteousness. It's a course correction back to what we should be doing. And he does it for his name's sake. And then the next slide, Kim. Um, this is, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I'm not going to read the rest of that in this minute because literally it means even though I walk through the valley of deep darkness, this is the valley of deep darkness that's between Jericho and Jerusalem. This is what David's talking about when he says this. This is literally the, where the rocks reach, seems like the sky, and this is the only path. There isn't anything, there's no nourishment in here. And it's scary and it's so narrow in some places that a sheep cannot turn around. But David says, and here David switches from, he switches to uh, first person and he says, even though I walk through the valley of deep darkness, you are with me. And so he feels the Lord's presence in this very, very, um, can be very scary place. Uh, especially for a sheep if they get spooked in there or if they're robbers or wolves or whatever. But he, we will not fear no evil because our Lord, the shepherd, the capital T, capital S, shepherd, is with our workers. And then um, he says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And, um, and I think... Um, I just want to mention a little bit about a rod. A rod is a defensive, a defensive weapon, and so it's what the shepherd uses. Um, I knew I had one that I was going to bring tonight, and I don't have it, but it was one that he could either throw. David did it a lot. He threw it and wounded the prey of the of the sheep, or um, if it it's a it's about this long, maybe 12, 14 inches long and kind of um, has a big ball on the end and then he can uh, wield it. But sometimes the prey had to get close enough for the shepherd, for David, who's writing this, to actually attack the wild animal and, and fend it off from his sheep. And so, um, do I have time to tell the story? How are we doing on time? Uh, we've got to move along. Okay. So I won't tell that story. <laughs> and, and then the staff, the rod and the staff, the staff is used to rescue or draw the sheep close enough to see what's bothering them. For me, it means knowing my workers and having their trust enough so that I can sense what's bothering them. Um, the best way ever to do that is a field visit face-to-face. -face. 
Um, if you can't do that, there's always there's always the digital world nowadays. Um, it was just a short little story about a worker that had gone to the field, hard field, hard language. She did it. She became uh, culturally sensitive. She adapted to the culture. She was making relationships. By the time I got to the field, she'd been there about a year and a half. Looked like she was doing great, except her walk with the Lord wasn't quite what it had been. And I looked on her shelf and I said, um, how are you with Jesus? And she said, oh, well, not like I was. Mm -hmm. And so I said, how about um, you read a chapter of this book every day. We'll meet for coffee. We're going to talk about Jesus every day while I'm here. I could pull her close to me with my staff. And that's what the shepherd does. He pulls the sheep close enough that can examine the sheep to see what's bothering them, um, what is pesky, or, or um, if, do they have a skin disease, has to pull the sheep close enough. Then you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Invocation is great here for us. It's not just when we send them off, and it's just not when they retire. It's when they're in the midst of the battle, when they're in the midst of the ministry. We actually set a table for them, like the Lord putting linen and china and crystal um, in the middle of the battlefield and saying, come with me for a while. And so how can we do that? Well, I'll let your imaginations figure that out. And then you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows, and surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of life, my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's a beautiful picture of how we can shepherd um, the sheep that are flung around the globe. I have a colleague who calls his blog Tending Scattered Wool, and that's what we do. So Brian, hmm. where are we? Awesome. So that this process, this phase we're talking about, it's called the, the mending and the tending phase. <clears throat> we call it that because part of the process of walking as a good shepherd, <clears throat> along with these people that we will hope to send, it means that pressure and growth and life is going to reveal to us that they have some areas where they need some attention and there's going to be, need to be some mending. We're not going to operate under the assumption that Although we have these really high opinions of, we really love and believe in these people. We want to walk with them as shepherds in a way that, that will reveal some areas where growth is needed. And we will bring opportunity for growth during this phase. So it's the development. We're really investing in them, coming to a place of deep trust. This is not just a dry, dusty assessment where people get nixed. They say, sorry, you're not good enough. You fail. It's not that type of interaction. It's a process of relationship building that will serve us once they're out of sight. And this is what prevents the out of sight from becoming out of mind. Because if that relationship mm -hmm. and this level of interaction isn't present, then when John and Mary, who are part of your, your, your church, when they come to you and they have issues and they're struggling in their marriage and they need your attention, along with a dozen other realities and fires to put out right in front of you, and the missionary who's far away that we have not gone through this type of process with will be out of mind. There are other more pressing, more urgent things, and unless we do some of the hard work on the front end, then we won't be able to really devote that bandwidth and attention to shepherding them well. So that's some of the mending and tending. There's some resources. There are three books that we've referenced there. Excellent places to turn. I'll just mention one right now, which is Serving in Senders Today by Neil Parolo. A great work to go through as a missions team that outlines a lot of the levels of care in the pre-field before they go while they're on the field and in re-entry what does it look like for a church to be well equipped to care for the missionaries well in those phases but on to the sending phase which we'll touch on briefly because that actual that time frame where we're actually sending them during the befriending and the mending and tending phases, you've started, you want to use this metaphor, you've started dating your missionary to a degree, and then you move from befriending into the, the tending. It's at that point, as you walk through some of those growth processes, that both the missionary and the church come to the conclusion to say, okay, we thought we wanted to go to the field, and now with certainty, we the church, we definitely want to send you. And the missionary is saying, you know what, we've been through all this stuff together, I definitely want to go because it's it is quite all right for some people to start this process and to walk together in such a way that they come to the conclusion either they themselves 
Are we the church that say, you know, this would probably be harmful and detrimental to your health and well-being for your family at this time. It'd probably be better if you took a chunk of time and really invested in your marriage and really focused on some, some really pivotal areas right now. And that is not dishonoring to the Lord and not indicative of failure at all. It's just wisdom. So then we come to the sending phase, which uh, you'll jump the slide that outlines a little bit that I won't go into much detail about. Uh, one thing here is that this requires intentionality so that we avoid the out of sight, out of mind. Here in this phase, it's really important that we get clear on that our missionaries know what we're expecting of them. They know what the agency that they're going to partner with, what the church expects of them. And there's real good clarity, what they are told with clarity that they can expect. Here's what we, the church, are going to bring to the table on your behalf. And the agency, likewise, there's the clarity of their roles between each uh, member of the partnership. And then pre for training to help them set them up for success. And that would be uh, a couple of things. I don't think, do we have time for a poll? If not, I'll jump. No, we just got a few minutes left. Then let's jump ahead. Uh, there are four tiers in this uh, model that we pulled out from a church that went into a whole lot of uh, specificity for ways that in the sending process, who do we send? And the only principle that I'll bring out here is this. Uh, there are four tiers in this particular model. I'm not advocating and we're not suggesting that your church needs to develop something like complicated um, detail. But what it means is we are not going to get as fully behind every missionary that our church supports. There are some missionaries working in regions or missionaries that we know to some degree that might be tier four. And, or tier three, and then there's some that might be tier one. So just coming to some wrestling with and coming to some conclusions about this is our primary focus and investment. So we're going to put everything behind those people working in those regions. Like I said, you'll have all these slides to review, and we tried to build them in such a way that we can, if we just emailed this to you, you wouldn't have the reference point to know what it is that we're talking about and how it can be useful. So we want to orient you to that and let you wrestle with that, the conclusions of your own. Okay, so some resources that would be helpful. Excellent. Two books right here are Well Sent and Mind the Gaps. And both of those are aimed at the local church and how can we be well armed to send well. So the last phase is that depending phase, which Don has talked a lot about. What does it look like for your missionary to go to the field and be on the far flung corner of the planet? They run up up against some significant challenges and have some needs and they're depending on us we need to be able to come to some other conclusion then if you're having trouble just come home and we'll fix it up here but to know where are the green, what's that we don't do that we don't do that no. yes where are the green pastures to your to your people how can we depend on them and how can they depend on us well here so we're making that shift to a lot of the sustaining practices we will. And then I reference here to the, there are five essential elements in this space, and there are six arenas that Neil Parolo details. These are the five really essential elements uh, prayer, trust, communication, visits, and advocacy. And those must go into this phase of, uh, of depending, of our missionaries being able to depend on us well. But they can't show up here for the first time. These are the ongoing and the continuation of what happens from that befriending and, and mending stage. Being an advocate of your missionary and all the various ministries of your church is huge and helps maintain that sense of connectedness while they're gone. And then that regularity of visits is going to be essential as well. Uh, that last slide, uh, the next one there is about, uh, okay, okay, yeah, that's Neil Parolo's six areas of support. And then Don and I really wanted to, uh, yeah, if we'll jump down two slides, we really wanted to close with this prayer for you guys. Um, Donna, I can, I, I can read it, but then we can pray. Tim, do we have just a minute to pray? Yes, and then I'll, I'll finish up the, the final couple minutes. I'll read it, and then would you close this for some word of prayer? No, this is the prayer. Well, perfect. Yeah, this, awesome. this is the prayer here, right here. All right. This, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus. That great shepherd of the sheep equip you 
with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us. What is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, uh, Brian and Donna, thank you for uh, packing in as much as you could into our 55 minutes. We really appreciate that. Uh, one thing that we didn't say at the beginning of the webinar is that in the follow-up email that everyone will receive tomorrow, uh, we will include your email addresses for them to contact because I'm guessing uh, people from different churches are going to latch on to a different area of what you uh, shared for uh, to, to dig into and to to open up uh, more completely. And so we will send the slides for, for reference for them, but then they can contact you uh, to, to really dive into one of these areas. So uh, for the rest of us uh, that are on the call, uh, we want to thank you for being on the call at Waypoint. Uh, I want to tell you about just two things, uh, three things, and then we'll be done. Uh, Waypoint uh, serves the established church, but we also start new ones. Here's a map of the 40 or so churches that we started in the last couple of decades. Uh, in our region. We're starting a new church this coming Sunday in Boone, North Carolina, uh, Mountainside uh, Church. Doesn't that sound like a great place to go to church? And uh, so if you're a supporting church of Waypoint, we are glad that you're helping us do that. If you're not a supporting church of Waypoint, we'd love for you to think about doing that to help us plant more churches more often. But specifically tonight, uh, I want to appeal to you as individuals to consider supporting Waypoint. We've got a new engine called iplantchurches.com, a website that you can go to on your computer, on your phone, and give as little as $5 a month recurring to help us plant more churches more often to reach more people. And uh, so uh, if you would go to that website, this webinar is free. There's no charge for it. It only gives us the platform to ask if you would support us uh, both as a church from monthly support, but also as an individual or a family. And so uh, we'll send you a link to that as well. You can go to your phone right now and sign up and you'll help us reach more and more people through the new churches that we start. Finally, I want, uh, almost finally, next to last, I want to give a uh, big thanks to our sponsor, Mid-Atlantic Christian University, that, uh, that sponsors this webinar series for us, and they're great ministry partners training kingdom workers around the globe. Last thing I want to do is just tell you about the next couple of uh, events that we've got coming up. They're webinars that you may not be interested in if you're a missions person because they're about something else. But it's likely that the people at your church that will be interested in these events uh, will hear them through you. Uh, and they may not be on our email list currently. And so our next one uh, coming up is this one uh, on April 10th. It's in about three weeks. And it's for elders. And it's talking about strategically recruiting your future elders. There's so many churches that have a current set of elders. But if two move away, I've, so many times I've asked their pastor, so what's your process for your next couple of guys? And they don't have a process to strategically recruit future elders and leaders at their church. And so that'll be led by Dr. Gary Johnson with E2 Effective Elders. And so please forward this email tomorrow, the link to that, that site, uh, to your elders to be a part of that. The one after that is for safety and security teams coming up in May. And uh, we've also got an on-site elder training coming up in May, on May 19th in Roanoke, if you're able to be there uh, for uh, leading your church well. With the, and it's uh, led by the E2 Effective Elders guys as well. So thank you for your time tonight. We are really thrilled with the participation that we've had tonight. Uh, we hope that you've got a glimpse of a vision for just moving the needle on how you care for even think about caring for your missionaries, that it doesn't take a whole lot of work to strategize and come up with a vision of, we really could make a difference in the life of our missionaries. And so uh, please stay tuned for the email tomorrow, and uh, you can dive into those resources. And uh, we're going to sign off, and hopefully we'll see you on an upcoming webinar very soon. So have a good evening.